welcome everyone. Um, today we are actually trying a different setting and I'm hoping that you can still enjoy with us our worship service for today. So my prayer is that God may sustain you as we begin together the worship service today. Uh, the Columbia Union has also designated this Sabbath to be a day of united prayer. So you can imagine, you know, just all the Adventists within Columbia Union and many uh, thousands around the world uniting in prayer. I want to invite you as uh, members of Life in Christ, as friends of Life in Christ, as guests, uh, to be able to join us wherever you are in the world or in the state of Delaware. We are thankful that you could join us. So let's just pray as we begin for our worship service today. Father, thank you for this time. We invite you to be with us. Guide us as a church wherever we are as we worship you. And for all the uh, many members, believers, wherever they gather today, just to unite in prayer, I ask that Lord Jesus, you may kindly hear our prayer and answer as well. Bless us, help us to have a wonderful experience today as we worship you together. For this is our prayer, trusting and believing in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you and welcome. Hello, church, and happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, guys. So we have made it safely through another week. And so we're all here to give God the glory and the thanks that he deserves. Amen. 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 So before we get into our praise and worship session for today, we are going to say a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we just want to say thank you for bringing us through another work week. And we're so grateful for the Sabbath day. We just pray now, Lord, that you be with us. I know we're in different locations, but I pray that as we sing songs, you unite our hearts together, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The first song says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good. Is good. Okay, kids, 
usher his presence with welcome into this place. Welcome into this place. again uh, for a time of prayer and it's definitely vital that we unite together in prayer the goodness about prayer is although we may not be all together in the same uh, building or the same premise uh, in our hearts as we pray to God it's like we are being united at the feet of Jesus Christ so I want to invite you at this time wherever you are if you're able to bow your heads with us as a church family, wherever you are, let's just bow our heads together before God. We're going to be praying uh, for many people who are affected uh, by the current situation. We want to pray for strength uh, in faith for every believer to still grow and trust in God. We uh, might know different individuals who are affected health-wise or economically. We want to take this time and pray for them. So just join us at this time and let's pray together. Father, we thank you because you have given us the blessing of prayer. And at this moment, for every brother or sister, we are kindly asking that you may unify us at this moment in prayer. And so, Lord, for our needs of our lives, for our spiritual need to be renewed, to be revived, we pray for the presence and the guidance of your Holy Spirit. We also pray that, Lord, you may help us that we might focus on you with hope during this season. Jesus, we are also seeking for your intervention, especially for the families who are affected one way or the other with the current uh, 
status uh, of life um, you know there's some who may not have jobs right now there are some who are exhibiting symptoms and some of them are anxious there are some who are sick right now and we're just in need of your healing that lord you may move by your spirit and do a great work within our state within the county within the country in the in the planet that lord you may just be able to impact whoever is going to listen to this prayer today and that by faith we can trust in you to hear our prayers Father, we're also praying because we have uh, different uh, close members and friends, our family, who are on the front lines uh, seeking to provide support for different people who are affected. I just pray that, Jesus, you may keep them safe. I pray for the leaders of the country. I pray for the leaders of the churches. I pray for the leaders in the homes and the leaders in the counties and uh, the leaders in the states that, Lord, you will bless each one. It's a time that all leaders need wisdom and I pray that God you may provide I also ask that in our service today we may experience you together even though we may not be connected physically but spiritually oh Lord help us to find the joy of being assembled at your feet thank you for hearing our prayer today for we ask trusting and believing in Jesus name amen Friends, we want to invite you again for our time in uh, worship and giving. Uh, you know, as we have been going through this time, we still realize that there are different uh, areas that we can still support together as a church. Uh, we definitely are recognizing what we have, what we do uh, is because of God. So we still are seeking to encourage one another to be faithful in our returning of tithes and offering. Uh, but also I want to just continuously appeal during this time, especially because of uh, the anticipation of different needs uh, for those who are able to give towards uh, support for especially families who are in need uh, that will be much appreciated uh, the board met recently the team has actually been constituted to work towards a good process to help families in this moment who are in need so remember just when you want to give it's not too complicated you have a chance to go on Adventist online giving and if you type in there you'll actually find that on um, the website itself on this top right corner there's an online giving slot you can actually click on that when you click on that it's going to give you this page where you can actually be able to participate in giving also if you want to give through the cash up handle you can do that uh, and the the, mo the idea this time friends is just to do the best we can not only to be faithful to god in our returning of tithes and offerings but to think about how we can be supportive to those who are in need uh, if you wish you could actually send a text message uh, to 302-482-5086 and make an appointment with our treasurer and see how we can support one another as a church during this time and may god bless you as you um, invest your resources in this time for those ones who are in need thank you happy sabbath again family the song I am going to be singing is called Take It to the Lord in Prayer. My husband absolutely loves this song. So um, I could not find the track to it. So I called my brother up and he played it for me. Then he sent it back. So prayerfully, this will be a blessing to all of us.
Our precious Savior, He is still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Some things we have not because we have had not. When we have a friend who's there, he's there. When we're weak and heavy laden, comfort with the load of care. We should never be discouraged when we take it to the Lord in prayer. Some things we have not because we have not when we Hi everyone, uh, I'm glad you could allow us to be in your home today. We are uh, thankful for the chance to, you know, still have a chance to fellowship, worship with you from home, although we are not still connected in the church uh, building as we used to. But I think as we have been learning through this process, you know, wherever you are, we are the church. So we are home, we are the church. You're at home, you're the church and that God can help us in our community, in our neighborhoods to be very practical in how, you know, life can be lived right now uh, for Jesus Christ. So before we uh, dive into the message, how about we say a prayer together? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love and care. And today we just want to pray that you may speak to our hearts. Allow us to hear your voice in a wonderful way. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So... Today's uh, message is focused on how the church survives. You know, we are going through a unique time as God's people. 
and it's a question of how do we survive living during this time. So last week, Pastor Josue began on an emphasis of um, why the church, and among the things that could be seen was uh, we need the church. There's a reason why Jesus was actually able to uh, build the church and allow us to be part of the church family. But we also saw that God uses the church to bless others. So that means wherever you are, wherever I am, uh, even in this middle of this crisis, it is actually a way that God can still use us to bless others. And many of the days when we have spent together in one building to, you know, encourage each other, but we come to a time when God can use us as a church body wherever we are to bless others as well. So to be able to now understand how the church survives in this time, I actually began to imagine, and I want to invite you to imagine with me. So uh, wherever you are as a family right now listening, or if you're by yourself at home, I just want you to join me on this imagination journey with me for these moments, and then we'll see how it can be a blessing. So here's a question that you may want to ask yourself. Have you ever attended a worship service in heaven? Well, uh, I really think in the literal sense, all of us can say no. I, I don't think uh, any of us has really been uh, carried up, you know, uh, defy gravity, go through the skies, make it to heaven, uh, I mean the third heaven, and then have a worship service. But I, I want you to imagine with me that we have a chance to actually do that. So we are soaring up together, we are going up, it's up in the sky, just imagine we are going through the, the sky and uh, we make it into heaven and we just arrive in time to actually see a worship service taking place in heaven. So, so think about how that will be. Like you, you just burst into heaven and you found a worship service going on. And, and this is the place that I want you to burst into the worship service with me, right? Are we together? So think like we're just getting in at this moment in the worship service. It's in Revelation 7, 11. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. So... You can imagine, we just walked in and you saw all these angels standing all around and the four elders and the living, the 24 elders, the living creatures, then all of a sudden, all of them just bow down. Now, I don't know what you're going to do, but my tendency is, hey, if everybody's bowing down, I'm beginning to think, I guess I need to do the same. So I may bow down as well. But, you know, even if you bow down, what do you... Uh, do when you walk into a worship service and millions of angels are bowing down uh, probably as I said I will bow down too so in that regard it may be a question of saying uh, am I just trying to follow other people but you know this is heaven so it's not like uh, we are bowing down to an idol let's God on the throne and all of us are bowing down but then these folks are not just bowing down, they're saying something. And you may be curious, what are they saying? Uh, the next verse actually tells us what they are saying. They are saying, Amen. Um, Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. So we just got in, everybody's bowing down, and the first thing they say is Amen. So, um, you know, one of the toughest moments uh, in our preaching right now we're used to preaching in a church with an audience where when a point really connects, people say amen. But when you're preaching in front of a camera, it's a kind of a different experience, you know. Um, the cameras really don't talk. Um, but you begin to ask yourself, what is this that actually was said in heaven that even <laughs> the angels saw value in saying amen? Uh, like, what does this powerful thing that was said that the holy angels who have never fallen into sin actually saw this is a brilliant moment to say amen. You say amen since I agree. So what is it that you can ask yourself? What are the angels in agreement with? What exactly was said that they are saying amen to? So that means we may need to go back a few moments and ask ourselves, what was said before we just got into this worship service in heaven. And so verse, uh, if, you, if you go back to earlier verses there, I believe actually that should be verse 10. It says, And they cried out in a loud voice, 
Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Huh. So, it seems some people are saying salvation belongs to our God and who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And the angel said, Amen. You can imagine the angels are agreeing with them, whoever these guys are. They are saying, you are right. Salvation belongs to our God. It's like saying, salvation is God's domain. That's really the key point I don't want you to miss. Because this group is actually not um, whispering. They're actually speaking aloud. They're saying, salvation belongs to God and to, and to the Lamb. So they have come to the place where they strongly believe in their hearts that this salvation is actually God's domain. That means, if it's coronavirus that's the problem, if you really need salvation, if God does not save us, um, human efforts will not succeed. If it's an economic problem that you have or I have, in heaven they're saying salvation is God's domain. So if you really need to have salvation out of a messy problem, it's God's domain. If it's sin, uh, let's say maybe uh, an addiction that you and I struggle with or something that you need victory over in your life. Salvation belongs to God and to the Lamb. In, in a sense, they're saying the only way to actually experience salvation is if God actually saves. And, and right now, you know, we all find ourselves in these different places and you are home, you know, um, Sometimes you have to go out and do a couple of things. Some of you work in the healthcare field. You have to go out and help people. It's just a good moment to remind ourselves. Salvation is not something that we necessarily do for ourselves. It's something that God does. So whether it deals with the finances, illnesses, um, you know, challenges of relationships and families, salvation happens because God makes it possible. And I'm just asking you today to realize that as a church, we survive because we acknowledge that. And so the key point that I want you not to miss, key point number one, is the church. That's you and me. We are a group of believers who have accepted that salvation is of God and the Lamb. Um, we don't find salvation anywhere else. We, we definitely are... Uh, rooting for the doctors to succeed in this thing, uh, you know, the healthcare providers to do well, the researchers to do well. But we, we are confronted with a powerful truth that if God does not save, there's nothing that can bring us out of this. So we are a group of people. When you're home, I'm home. Wherever we are, we are called a church because we have agreed to one thing. Salvation happens because God makes it possible. And you will see briefly why that makes sense, you know, for us right now. So you may then ask yourself, because we just burst into this worship service. So who are these guys who are talking? Who are these guys who said something so profound that even the angels were actually willing to agree, you know? Um, so let's see who these guys are. You skip now to verse 13. In verse 13, it says, Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? You know, so these are guys who we just see, they are dressed in all white robes and, and they are the ones who are speaking out loudly. It's like they are taking over the heavens worship service and they are saying something so profound and the angels are accepting. And, and the question was, who are they? Uh, and where did they come from? Like, which planet did these guys show up from? Because it seems like these guys were not the natives of heaven, so to speak. And they have just bust in by the way you know this story is actually being recorded by john in the book of revelation so this question was actually being posed to john and if it was being posed to you and me if you just bust into worship you may not know so uh, john actually answered something like you and i could have answered if we did not know he said i answered sir you know but you see the thing that i don't want you to miss out of this powerful moment is this that these people are probably people that John could have recognized, but based on their circumstances or situations right now, it's like they are looking so good that he cannot tell who they are. That's really one way to look at this part of the story. And I want you to understand this second key point, then let me explain it. That God saves in such a way that you don't look like what you have been through. So, 
if you get to really understand what's going on in this story, I think it's going to make a big difference because Revelation 7 verse 14 explains this group of people. Who are these people? Um, and he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Let me translate that for you. This, folks, this is the church. This is the church. The church has arrived in heaven. The scene in Revelation 7 is the church finally arriving in heaven. And they have gone through so much. They have gone through the great tribulation. They have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. And this church is just saying, Amen. Friends, when John saw, John saw you and me, I believe by faith, that we made it into God's kingdom. And when we made it there, we have been through a mess on this side of the planet. But <laughs> we don't look like the mess we have been through. Because the hope of what God is able to do, He is able to deliver in such a powerful way that John couldn't even recognize who these guys were. Because you see, John had heard about them, but in a different setting. It's like saying it this way in our present day context. Let's say you have been in an accident. And when you came out of that accident, when people saw the car that you are in, and they see you, they begin to wonder, how did you come out of that? It's a recognition that God saved you in such a way that you can't explain. All you know is that God saved you. You know, another scenario to consider here is, let's say when you are really sick, and people sometimes may look at you, and they may not actually be able to recognize, you know, how, how could you have been so sick and transformed in such a way that your life looks so different. Uh, maybe you may have lived uh, in a particular addiction that you struggled with. You know, we all know ourselves. But God has a way to transform us in such a way that we don't really look like where we have been. Because these guys have been out of the great tribulation. Now, so you don't think I'm making this stuff up. I, I appreciate um, one uh, professor, Ranko Stefanovic from uh, Andrews University, who actually wrote the Sabbath School Quarterly on the Book of Revelation. He observes that in the book of Revelation, there is a very unique pattern that uh, John writes with, and it's called, I heard and I saw pattern, uh, which means John sees some, uh, hears something, then when he goes to see, what he sees is described differently than what he saw, but is actually the same thing, or the same person. So let's see what this looks like. So, we'll look at the Bible text, we'll look at what John heard, we'll look at what John saw. So, for example, in Revelation chapter 1 uh, and verse 10, John heard a voice as a trumpet. So, you may be able to expect when he turns around, he sees a trumpet blowing, but no. When he turns around, he sees Jesus walking amidst the lampstands. And it's kind of very similar because... You may want to think about this, especially in the context of even the second coming, what really happens there. But then another situation is Revelation 5, which normally describes it even much better. In Revelation 5, John hears the lion of the tribe of Judah has overcome. And so John gets excited to see a lion, of, the lion of the tribe of Judah. But when John turns around, he sees a lamb having been slain. It's the same being being represented, but with two aspects or two phases of that particular being, in this case being Jesus Christ. Another context that this happens is in Revelation 17, where John actually hears about a great prostitute who sits on many waters. Then when he actually goes to see, he sees a woman who is sitting on a scarlet beast. And so you begin to think, is it the same thing? Well, you begin to realize it's the same pattern John is describing. And so here you also see in Revelation 21, John hears, hey, I'm going to show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. But when he goes to see, he sees the holy city, the new Jerusalem. And, and there are times that you can get confused with this, which sometimes has caused a lot of... Um, sometimes debates among the church members, you know, trying to say, who are the 144,000, you know, the Bible says about that. But you really, when you realize what's going on here, John is using the same literary technique, which is, I heard and I saw. That means, first, when you read the book of Revelation 7, he first hears 
144,000 who were sealed. But when he gets to actually see them, it's the great multitude. What am I trying to say with all this, especially how the church survives? To understand this, I've kind of tried to create a diagram here for us. So there are two points in time. The first point in time is when John hears about the 144,000. At this point in time, when John hears about them, these guys are just about to go through something. What they're just about to go through is what is called the Great Tribulation. They're just about to go through it. And so they are organized the way the nation of Israel could have been organized for war in units of a thousand out of the 12 tribes. And so it's like 12,000 from every tribe. It's like units. It's like an army, military organized, ready for battle. But after the Great Tribulation, they are no longer in a war setting. They have made it through the war setting. And at this time, they are looking, looked at a different time and they just refer to as the great multitude. Now, why is that even important? Because it is these guys who have come out of the great tribulation. These are the ones who have come out of that great tribulation. They had been prepared for war. They have fought this fight. They have been able to overcome by the blood of Jesus. And they have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. And they have overcome. Friends, that's you and me. Ready through this. And by God's grace coming through to the end by His mercies. And when we come and cross over to this other side. It's a blessing to see that we can stand before the throne of Jesus Christ and declare how salvation belongs to the Lord and to, to the Lamb. So here's something to think about. You think about what did the redeemed, what, what did the believers, uh, by God's grace, is, let's say it's you and I who have been blessed to live in the last days of earth history and then we have made it through to the promised land. We have stood before the Father. What is it that we will say? What is it that we will say then that will actually make the angels agree with us and bow down? You see, these are the same angels who have been protecting you and me. Uh, they have been walking with you and me in moments of trial and moments of pain. But here, these angels, when we say something in that great multitude after coming out of the great tribulation, they are actually willing to say, wow, amen to that. You know, I, I wish to have a life that I live or uh, a sermon that I preach that the angels could actually say amen. Uh, they, they see it from heaven's perspective and they say, yeah, we agree because that's the truth about God. And this is why in this key point number three, I want you to realize why. What is it they say? Because the focus of the redeemed is on salvation of God and not on their misery. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know. I'm not saying that it's bad to tell stories when we have gone through some things, but what sometimes begin to happen is there's a way in which as a human being, after going through a, a, an experience, sometimes I relieve that experience a lot in my stories in such a way that I don't even describe the victory that God gave. I just describe the pain and the frustration of what the issue was, you know, uh, you know, at some point, uh, someone says, you know, yeah, I went through this. It was a bad experience and, and it was traumatizing. But then what happens is that is if I keep on rehashing that, I miss the goodness of what God had done. And it's like I'm relieving my own painful experience all over again. I want to say it this way. How does the church survive in moments of crisis? The church does not survive in times of crisis by rehashing their problems. Uh, the church does not survive by repeating their failures. You and I don't survive as a church because we keep on telling the story of how miserable life is or how painful life is. I'm not saying we ignore it. I'm just saying if that becomes the focus, it does not help us to grow. We actually feel stuck in that moment. And, and the way that sometimes I will look at this is to put it this way. Sometimes if you think about it, we are Christians who pray. But the question is, where is our focus when we pray? It makes a big difference. Let me try to illustrate it this way. 
assuming that that big circle represents our big God, and this uh, a kind of a shape here represents the problem, the question becomes, am I praying while focusing on God, that is me here focusing on God, I know there's a problem, but I'm focusing on God, trusting that God will do something. Or am I focusing on the problem while I talk to God? Because it's like saying if when Peter was talking to Jesus, when his focus was on Jesus, it did not mean that the waves were not going to threaten his life. They were going to do it, but his focus was on Jesus. But when he took his eyes off Jesus and focused on the problem, Peter begins to drown. And we know that story in the Bible really well. And in a way, it really applies to all of us. Even right now, I'm not saying we ignore that coronavirus is going on. I don't say we ignore that people are suffering out of it. I'm just asking you and me, what is your mindset? Is your mindset focusing on the problem as you pray to God? Or are you focusing on God as you pray about the problem? Because friends, I want to assure you, the more you focus on God, you realize the greatness of your God it affects how you handle the problem and how you go about it. And it doesn't mean you become careless. It just means that in your mind, you don't find yourself being a prisoner of despair, but you actually find yourself being more hopeful about what God is able to do. And I want to read this from you from Review and Herald's uh, March 19, 1889, that says, We talk altogether too much about the power of Satan. It is true that Satan is a powerful being, but I thank God for a mighty savior who cast the evil one from heaven. We talk of our adversary, we pray about him, we think of him, and he looms greater and greater in our imagination. Why? Because we, the more you focus on the power of Satan or what he's doing, he becomes big in your head. You don't think you're able to become victorious. And then she says, now why not talk of Jesus? Why not think of his power and his love? You see, Satan is pleased to have us magnify his power. Hold up Jesus, meditate upon him, and by beholding, you will become changed in his image. You know, Jesus told us about the time that we live in, and this is the way he described it. He said, people will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming in the world. You know, people are scared. People are fearful. Jesus said when there comes a time when there are wars, when there are earthquakes, when there are pestilences, people are afraid. And he even includes the aspect of the heavenly bodies will be shaken. And then he talks about the coming of the Son of Man. But I want you to realize now in verse 28, he tells us how to respond. He says, when these things begin to take place, Stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Church, you're home. We can focus on the news 24-7 and realize we're getting depressed. And I'm not saying we don't stay informed. I'm just appealing to you and me that we cannot afford to have our minds continually focus on the problem and not focused on our God. Jesus says the way to get through this is to look up. So the church survives because we have learned not to look at our problems. So here's the thing. The church survives by an active focus on the author of salvation. And here's my question to you. Are you actively focusing on the author of your salvation? Are you actively focusing on Jesus? Are you actively spending time in his word to hear his promises for this season? Are you actively focusing on his word to hear his command for you, for what you can do to make a difference to people around you, those um, who are struggling financially or those who are impacted by the illness already or those who need a word of hope in their moment of despair? Um, the reason why I was making this appeal from the beginning of the focus is because I realized this. Today, I want to appeal to you to begin to consider whether it's through your giving or through the food you have, where you see there's a need. Uh, the food pantries, the food banks will need support. And even we in the local uh, church of the members that you know will need support. But you see, if your focus is on the problem, even when they say, hey, can you spare $50 to give to someone? You can't. 
Because you see, you're only imagining how the problem will get worse and you can't get through it. But if you're focusing on the big God, you realize everything you have, everything I have comes from that God. And you are actually able to give freely because you know God is able. And so my appeal today is that we can do something to make a difference in the society around us, to the people who are feeling uh, uh, anxious and those who are desperate, to the people who are uh, in need of resources right now because the economic situation doesn't look good, people who need food, uh, people who are struggling with the illness or who are uh, exhibiting signs of coronavirus and they're struggling how life is going to be. You and I can make a difference, but we cannot make a difference if we focus on the problem. We only make a difference when we have an active focus on Jesus Christ. And so here's my prayer. The church survives by an active focus on the author of salvation. That is you and me. Focus on Jesus. Focus on his ability. Focus on his power. Remember, salvation belongs to God and to the Lamb. This is the song we're going to sing when we get to stand before the throne. We can actually be privileged to begin declaring that now. And when we learn that right now, even when you're home, or you're on the street, the angels will join you and say, Amen. You got that right. Salvation belongs to God and to the Lamb. So let's be who God has called us to be in this season. Let us be the givers. Let us be uh, the prayer warriors. Let us be the people who invest time in His Word and come out with hope because our focus is on God and not on our problems. This is how the church will survive. We can do it. A big difference in our society right now but we have to have our minds and our heads in the right place and that is a focus on the one who inhabits all honor and praise and in whose domain is salvation our God and the Lamb let us pray together father thank you for being gracious to us and now we just want to pray that we as a church we need your power but Lord we need your spirit to guide us so that our minds will focus on you and the salvation that you are able to give our circumstances will not save us you will and we need to trust in you lord jesus so help us now to have that firm faith knowing you're able to do great things i pray for every person who's listening right now that you may inspire them to understand that focusing on the problem does not mean that we are obsessed by it but we need to focus on you our god and king that you may give us the hope and inspiration on how to cope and to deal with the problems around us may this be our declaration that salvation belongs to god and to the lamb and to that may the angels may the 24 elders may the living creatures and all in heaven and earth unite in saying amen amen god bless you and by God's grace, we'll have a chance to reconnect again next Sabbath.